Good evening, everybody. Let me introduce you to Joe Bloggs, or what's left of him. As the vicar said at Joe Bloggs' funeral, every community needs a Joe. He was the sort of person, never in the limelight, always working way behind the scenes. The church pantomime, there would be Joe Bloggs, putting together the scenery, making sure all the props and lights and everything worked. The church fete, there would be Joe setting up the stalls in the morning, and last night he would be going home having finished the day long after everyone else. Very useful sort of chap very willing, very self-effacing. And so when he died earlier this summer, his family and friends thought long and hard about a suitable epitaph for him. And they thought, well, Joe Buck was always a really useful man. And so maybe he's died and now Jesus has got jobs for him to do. And so they came up with this lovely epitaph, and I'm sure it's in the Bible somewhere, his Lord had need of him. Anyone know where that's from? Okay, I'll tell you. Jesus spoke to his disciples, saying, Go to the village over against you, in the which, at your entry, you shall find a donkey tied, whereupon never man sat. Loose him and bring him hither, and anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Thus shall you say to him, Because the Lord hath need of him. The moral of this is, if you want to avoid being like Joe Blocks, memorised in perpetuity as an unbroken donkey, make sure that your family and friends know their Bibles and they know the context. Now, I assure you, Joe Bloggs is just a figment of my overactive imagination, but it's a very fair point, I think. And here's another example. I'm sure we've all sung this one. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? Because we just read those words. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? And next time we sing these words, just think of what we're committing ourselves to. Because those who stood up on the Lord's side received a rather terrifying commission. Moses said to them, Right, put your sword on, and you're going to go through the camp, killing as you go. Not killing anybody. Killing your brother, companion, and neighbour. Who is on the Lord's side? Would we sing those words quite so lustily if that was the outcome? And that's where those words come from. But hang on, surely this one can't be misinterpreted. Peace on earth. Isn't this the whole thrust of the Christian message? That somehow, through the gospel, a sense of friendship and mutual respect, like a global group hug, will pervade the earth. And everything will be fine because there will be peace on earth. That's, that's what the churches are striving to achieve. Surely we can't get that one wrong. Well, if we look for that particular expression, we find it in Matthew 10. And it's Jesus speaking. He says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Oh, that's just one example. Okay, let's try another. Same incident, this is Luke reporting it. Suppose ye, says Jesus, I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you no, but rather division. That's a bit worrying, isn't it? Because here is this expression, peace on earth, used twice, and that's the only two times it's used in that form. And both of them, Jesus is saying, no, I'm not all about peace on earth. Let's just take a little bit of a side, because sword and division, it seems that religion has a bad name. It's not lived up to expectations. In fact, many people claim it's responsible for the mess the earth is in today. And it can be seen why people make this association. Here's a comment that came back to me on the internet when I was sort of um, having a wrangle about this. Since wars are driven by greed and religion, it reaffirms my belief that religion is at the root of all evil. If we rid this world of religion, brackets, entirely founded on superstition and myth, then it will be a safer, kinder, fairer, gentler place. And my battery's playing up here. Um, it will be a kinder, safer, gentler, more forgiving, and all round better place for all to live in. Nice plan, God. And I don't need to emphasise the sarcasm in that. Now, just as those other two examples are need a bit more investigation, so does this one. 
Religion is the source of all the killing and fighting and wars on the earth. Well, right at the top there, I know it's small writing, but Mao Zedong, communist China, communist godless China, in pursuit of his motives, killed up to 80.2 million people. Wow, that's, that's the population of British, that was a bit more. Um, Pre-revolutionary Chinese communists, again under this wonderful Mao Zedong, three and a half million. Cultural revolution, another four million. This guy just couldn't stop, but he's not a religious <coughs> person. Um, early communist revolution, revolution under Lenin, atheist, four million people die. Um, Stalin, now here's a man who knows how to kill people, 49 and a half million people. Many of them sent to die in terrible conditions in the Gulag Peninsula. Um, Nazi Germany, not quite sure what religion, if any, motivated Hitler, but it certainly wasn't any religion we would associate with. 20.9 million people died as a result of that war. If we get right to the bottom, the Armenian massacres, that's Islamically inspired, and you've got 1.9 million. So, with all the shouting to do about Islamic fundamentalism, actually, they're not even on the main list. So bear this in mind, when someone says to you, religion is causing so much war in the world, rubbish! The main problem is those people who have thrown religion out of the window. But the question is then, if religion isn't to blame, what is? And let's leave that question hanging for a little while. Now, Jesus had a very original way of teaching. In that he didn't use original ideas. What he did was he took established ideas from what we call the Old Testament and presented them in an original way, in a way that those people he spoke to, many of whom were absolutely dead against him, when they heard their scriptures they were familiar with, they heard it in such an original way, they knew deep down that Jesus was getting right to the heart of the Old Testament message. Look at Jesus' parables, I put almost in brackets, I would almost take that word out. I can confidently say that most of Jesus' parables, if not all of them, have an Old Testament origin. It's a fascinating study. Jesus drew items out of the Old Testament and wove stories around them. Um, he drew out hidden meanings in Old Testament scriptures so that people had known these scriptures all their life. I'm like, wow, how did this guy do this? How does he draw out so many wonderful thoughts? And Jesus was really showing us that he wasn't hanging on the telephone to his father. He, God wasn't sort of whispering in Jesus' ear. What he'd done, he'd read and assimilated the Old Testament scriptures, the words that God gave him, and those words, if you like, came out from Jesus, but they were God's words. And Jesus' message is sometimes mistakenly seen to sort of mollify the austere, rather vicious God of the Old Testament. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. And there's no more a dangerous concept than this, that Jesus is sort of like redressing the balance of a rather grouchy Old Testament God. So, if we look at Jesus' teaching and we listen for echoes in it, we can better understand the message he's conveying. We say, well, what, where's, what's Jesus thinking about when he makes a particular teaching? What, where's he going back to in the Old Testament? Look at that Old Testament scripture and suddenly it starts to open up for us. So, we need to establish what Jesus was meaning when he said these words, I'm not come to bring peace, but a sword. Are there echoes here of an Old Testament event? Well, we've just been reading about it, haven't we? Let's just look to that reading again, Exodus 32. I'm not going to go through the whole chapter, just pick a few verses out. Exodus 32, verse 1. The people, they were, they've been brought out of slavery in Egypt. They've been brought through the Red Sea. They witnessed fantastic miracles. And now they've been brought to the bottom of this Mount Sinai. It might be that one. It might be another one. But that's called Mount Sinai. It'll do for this evening. Um, and Moses goes up this mountain to talk with God. And it's a long time coming back. So the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain. They gathered themselves together to Aaron and said unto him, Make us gods which shall go before us. For us, this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Don't really care either. So they made gods. Verse 4, 
Aaron received gold at her hands and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a molten calf and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Interesting that, because they've made an Egyptian idol, but they proclaim this a feast to Yahweh, the God who has brought them up out of Egypt. So it's a mixture of idolatry and true worship. <clears throat> Verse 6, they rose up early in the morrow, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And they did not play football, they didn't play round as they went a very, very different direction. As becomes clear when we read verse 25, they were naked. They were getting up to no good. Because of this, God threatened to exterminate them. He said, Moses, stand aside. I'm going to wipe this lot out. I'm going to make a great nation of you. Moses just read it. He beseeches God and said, look, Lord, what would people say that you couldn't bring them to this land? You killed them in the mountains. And that's not the first time Moses intercedes. Verse 32, Moses says, Lord, if you can't forgive their sin then block me out of your book. Twice Moses intercedes on behalf of this rather weird, odd people of Israel. And then we read this expression we've mentioned before. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me, and all the sons of Levi gather themselves together unto him. Right. Is that possibly where Jesus gets this idea from? Whosoever says Jesus shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. Who will deny me, I will deny him before my Father in heaven. And he said the same, much the same thing again in Luke. He who is not with me is against me. Jesus is, you know, in more words, restating what Moses said. Who is on the Lord's side? Stand up now, because if you don't stand up, you're not on the Lord's side. And Jesus is saying the same thing. If you confess me now, you're on the Lord's side. Abstention, sitting on the fence, call it what you will, is not an option. <clears throat> and then we read in Exodus, those who were on the Lord's side were told to put every man his sword by his side. <coughs> Jesus has said, don't think I'm come to send peace on the earth, I've come not to send peace, but a sword. So we've got the same pattern again. We've got Exodus and Jesus is repeating the themes in his teaching. Carrying on in Exodus, every man to go from gate to gate and slay his brother, his companion and his neighbour. Jesus said, I'm come to set at variance, father and daughter against a mother, daughter-in-law against a mother-in-law, and a man's foe shall be they of his own household. This is not an accident. If you have one echo, yes, that might be a coincidence, but we've had three so far and there are more to come. Jesus is drawing our attention forcibly to this incident. He's telling us there are vital lessons to learn. But notice Jesus doesn't say to his hearers, he doesn't say, oh, if you'd like to turn up Exodus 32. He doesn't do that. He leaves these, he, he sets off these ideas and leaves us to follow them back to their source. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. Now, in Luke's account, Luke prefaces Jesus' words about peace on earth with this a wicked servant set in charge of the household. He says, my Lord delays his coming. It's another echo of the same incident. And the next day we read that the people rose early, sacrificed burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings, and then they got up to eat and drink and indulge in revelry, or play, as the authorised version reads it. And it's repeated in what Jesus said. That servant says in his heart, My Lord delayed his coming, and shall begin to beat <coughs> men, servants and maidens, and eat and drink, and to be drunken. So, time and time again, Jesus is setting off the echoes, and he's asking us to follow them back to the source, which I suggest to you is Exodus 32. So why is he doing this? What's he trying to tell us about God's feelings towards mankind? Well, Psalm 106 repeats this incident from God's point of view, and it says here that they made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus they changed their glory, in other words, their God, their Father who created them, they changed their glory into the similitude on ox that eateth grass. 
Now, this was the point to which God was about to issue his laws to the people he'd drawn unto himself. He called Israel by name. These laws would teach the people how to conduct themselves in ways pleasing to God. It was an absolutely crucial moment. It should have been the point of the start of a long and loving relationship. But at this point, Israel sinned terribly. They sinned openly and irrevocably. They were offered communion with Almighty God, but they chose a cow instead. And you can't overemphasize the terrible nature of what they've done. And God's punishment was swift and decisive. Peace was taken from the nation to be replaced by violence and suffering. Families were torn apart by a sword decreed by God himself. A revolting wickedness had occurred and it had to be paid for. So God issued moral, perfect moral guidelines to the world. They are absolute standards. And these decrees, if you like, are the starting point for a relationship between God and mankind. The relationship is absolutely exclusive. God cannot be shared with an idol. And once this relationship was broken, the consequences followed. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And at the end of that we read, God says, I will visit their sin upon them. So why did Jesus invoke this instance, and how does it answer our question, will there ever be a time for peace? Well, in equally absolute terms, mankind is presented with an option to serve God faithfully and consistently, and this is called righteousness. Or we can reject God and pursue our own course, and this is called wickedness. There is no middle course. Righteousness, wickedness. <coughs> And sadly, in God's estimation, there's an awful lot of wickedness around. Wickedness pours across the earth, bringing in dirt and filth and rubbish. The world is full of violence because it is filled with wickedness. Paul took up this idea in his book of Romans. He said, God will render to every man according to his deeds, to those and this is one side of the choice. Those who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, God will render them eternal life. But to those who are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Very clear-cut choice. They both carry consequences. Eternal life of tribulation and anguish. There is no middle course. And again, in God's estimation, the world has made that wrong choice so often that the whole world lies in wickedness. And essentially, this pattern of the golden calf has been repeated countless times in human history. God has issued his absolute moral standards to every generation, together with the warning what will follow if it's treated with contempt. And each generation has responded by diluting or even flatly ignoring God's requirements. Religious leaders, and it was Aaron in Moses' day, and there are many more since then, they try to mingle human values with the worship of God. And the people, bereft of moral guidance, fashion morality in whatever way they see fit. So why did Jesus use this incident? What's he trying to tell us? Well, there's his words again leading up to his peace on earth statement. Whosoever there shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father. What Jesus is saying is, it's decision time. Jesus presents us with the same perfect moral example, in much the same way Moses brought down the Ten Commandments, the, the perfect decrees of God to govern Israel. Jesus presents these in, a, in example form. This moral example that Jesus presents is not theoretical, it's not homespun, it's de derived from the teaching and character of God found in the Old Testament. That's why Jesus drew all his teaching from the Old Testament. And in the same way that Israel became restless, waiting for the return of Moses, our world has begun to question and finally totally discard the idea of God, Jesus Christ and impending judgment. Our world has mixed a form of out-religion into something satisfactory to all. Mainstream churches have compromised the truth, and not surprisingly, bereft of any firm moral guidance, people have turned to revelry. And you ask yourself today, what is the biggest 
industry around the world, entertainment and personal fulfilment. And confronted with the same situation as Israel were at Sinai, our world has responded in much the same way. Where is the promise of his coming? So what Jesus is drawing our attention to is the finality of the choice before us. As long as our world continues to reject God's ways, it will experience the savagery of man's ways. And if this was as far as it went, it would be a dismal prospect. It would mean that there are no peace negotiations will ever work, no arms limitation strategies, no airstrikes, no counterinsurgency. None of these will make the slightest difference to the endemic violence in our world because our world has chosen to reject God's standards. Or, as Job so succinctly put it, man is born to trouble. Now, earlier this year, we gave out these leaflets. And there were these quotations on these leaflets, you noticed them. Great peace have those who love your law. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people. Notice that. Those are subsets of humanity. Not to everybody, but to those who love God's law and those who are his people. Our title, A Time for Peace, is part of a longer title, Ecclesiastes 3, and it starts a time of war and a time of peace. And I suggest to you in that order. Peace, it seems, is not something that comes from within mankind. The Lord will give it. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The Lord will give strength to his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. It's not something found in human nature. The best we can hope for is an absence of war. And as the Middle East shows, that's not a very hopeful prospect. Psalm 37. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. That's, put that one in because aren't those words familiar? Aren't they the words of which Jesus opened his teaching and Sermon on the Mount? Depart from evil and do good, seek peace and pursue it. It's not something that is going to be found as a default nature in human nature. It's something that God gives that we have to seek. We could go on showing verse after verse, showing that God promises peace on his own terms. Whatever peace accords mankind make, they will fail. War will continue to blight our planet. And if anybody says peace in our time, they're either deluded or a liar. Well, we're at this sort of time of year, aren't we? The, the cosy time of year, little babies in mangers and shepherds and kings and stuff. And we've got a sort of thing that appeals to a lot of people in society. We've got a helpless child conceived to an unmarried mother, born in poverty, acclaimed by the lowest of his society, hounded by a violent king. A child who has become the icon of the dispossessed, the downtrodden, the misfit and the helpless. There's no doubt Jesus resonates with the nonconformist, but it would be a serious mistake to leave him there. If Jesus is only found to be a convenient emblem for those who are dissatisfied with life to rally around, then humanity would be making another grave mistake. He is called the Prince of Peace. And that's not a redundant title. Prince means to have authority or rule over. So this child is not to, destined to be the, the vague aesthetic of popular culture who appears, appeals only to the tree huggers who are disaffected. Jesus is a very real political figure with a very real agenda and a very real power base. <coughs> Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform. This is what Jesus is all about. The same man who threw down a challenge to those who listened to him to choose whose side they were on will issue an ultimatum to our world torn apart with war and violence. Firstly, we can expect a decisive event in world history. This same Jesus Christ, who calls upon us to make up our minds, 
will appear to the world with an equally uncompromising message. The TV networks, the internet, Facebook, Twitter, and all the public media will be saturated with coverage of this man who has appeared in the Middle East and will declare himself Son of God. The whole world will know when Jesus returns. And he will come with supernatural power, with the glory of his Father and with his angels. An extraordinary appearance, a judgment in keeping with the terms of Sinai. And the warning Jesus gave, those who are ashamed of him in this adulterous and sinful generation, Jesus will be ashamed of them when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Those who despise God's laws will be in turn despised. It's, this, this, the fence is infinitely thin, there is no middle course. And I say to you, says Jesus, who shall confess me before men? Him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. It leaves no room for compromise. And then you have this lovely Psalm 72, which tells us what Jesus will do when he returns. The pattern doesn't change, does it? Moses comes down from Mount Sinai, bringing laws that would have established peace and justice upon the earth, and the people turn their back on them. Christ will come down from heaven with the same offer. He shall judge thy people with righteousness and thy poor with judgments. The mountain shall bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy. But those who rebel and exalt themselves against God, he will break in pieces the oppressor. In his day shall, righteous, shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. This will be an enduring peace, not a ceasefire while opposing armies regroup and rearm. And that lovely expression, abundance of peace, was quoted in Psalm 37. All kings shall fall down before him, all nations shall serve him. This isn't just hyperbole, this isn't just sort of pie-in-the-sky idealism. All nations, think of the nations of this world, think of their rulers, think of um, all the different countries and the political figures at the top. All they will come down and bow down before the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no doubt which parts of the suffering earth Jesus will take priority over. He will deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also and him that have no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. The violence, which is part of a natural product of rebellion and disobedience, will be a thing of the past. <coughs> and his name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. All nations shall call him blessed. All nations this will be a universal kingdom of God that will subdue all the warring nations. The earth will be one country. And he will do so by force of conquest. What else does this world seem to understand? He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Well, hang on, you might be sort of thinking, Oh, that expression, peace on earth, is somewhere else in the Bible. I'm just trying to think where it is. Well, I'm a bit disingenuous here, because it is there, but not in the same order. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace. Goodwill towards men. So there is a promise of peace on the earth. But as before, we must pay attention to the order. There will be peace and goodwill towards men when God's requirements are met and when his standards are satisfied. This is what is meant by glory to God. When you can go walk around your neighbourhood and talk to everybody and they all say, isn't God wonderful? When you can walk down the streets of Bristol, down Cabot Circle and say to people, what do you think of God? Oh, he's wonderful. Isn't Jesus so good? When all that is happening, there will be peace on earth, or on earth peace. Not until. So what then? What does this mean for you and me? 
Well, in Acts, it's reported to Simeon. And I think this was the Simeon who held Jesus as a baby in the temple. He declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And this people for his name have the feature that God will bless his people with peace. They are those who love his law. They are the ones who God promises peace to. And they shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The upshot is simple. God is calling the people out of this world to be citizens of Christ's kingdom. The germ of that nation, that country that will spread over all the earth and subdue all the warring nations. He's asking for us to be part of that. So if you're afraid, if you're anxious, you're apprehensive about the future of the world, you've got every right to be. There are weapons often more plentiful than bread. There are deadly explosives which can be fashioned into your underwear, which can blow you and 20 or 30 people around you to pieces. There are chemical and biological agents held by men and women with dangerous and horrible ideas which people seem ready to kill or die for. And the root cause of all this is always the same, a disregard for the true God and a mingling of homespun or borrowed religious ideas. And get worse it will. If we take Christ's words at face value, it does offer us consolation. There is a sanctuary. There is a refuge of trust that God is ultimately in control and will intervene in Earth's future to avoid the disastrous outcome. But sadly, there's probably a lot more to go now before we can be assured of the return of Christ. Things are going to get worse. And so Jesus' words, peace I give you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. But you do have to make that choice. The fence is infinitely thin. You can't sit upon it. And that's what Jesus promises you. Peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.